during the liturgy of, the, of Good Friday, the church gathers to hear the narration of our Lord's passion, pray for the needs of the church and the world, and to venerate the cross of our salvation. Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection, sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal Mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Our reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See. See. My servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted, even as many were amazed at him. So marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he startle many nations. And because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see. For those who have not heard it shall ponder it. And who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured. While we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses and crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes, we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth like a lamb sent to the slaughter or a sheep before the shears. He was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers though he had done no wrong, nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. 
If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life. And the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in the fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many. And their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked. And he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, He became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Glory to you, word of God, Lord Jesus. Christ. Glory to you, Word of God, Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to you, Word of God, Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to you, Word of God, Lord Jesus Christ. Lord be with you. And with your spirit. The passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. You may be seated for the reading of the passion. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus, the Nazarene, he said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them when he said to them, I am. They turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus, the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you, that I am. So you, if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said, I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it 
and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guard seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better if that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid who was, at the, was the gatekeeper said to Peter, you are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that had been made because it was cold and they were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there to keep warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather, and in secret I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I had spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I had spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Peter was standing there, keeping warm, and they said to him, Are you not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off said, didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning. 
And they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more, Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law. And according to that law, he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and I have power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold, your king! They cried out, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. And then Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified.
So they took Jesus. And carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each shoulder, a soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top down. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will, it will, for whose it will be, in order that the scripture passage might be fulfilled that says, they divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what's, what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over his spirit. Please kneel. Please stand. Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs, but one soldier thrust his lance into his side and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified to this and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled, not a bone of his will be broken. And another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus. And Pilate permitted it. So Joseph came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh 
and aloes weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths along with the spices according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden. <clears throat> and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. It came to pass on a distant hill and in the course of history seemingly not a long time ago. It was a hill of death and suffering, a hill of infirmity and affliction, upon which waged a battle for the loyalty of men's hearts. Over the passage of time, the events on that hill would impact the course of a people and probe the depths of souls. It was on a distant hill, just a few short miles east, east of Richmond, Virginia, that the Confederate and Union armies met on July 1st, 1862, in the Battle of Malvern Hill. In the larger confrontation in and around Fredericksburg, this battle was quite fierce. To this day, if you were to visit the battlefield, you would find there a memorial of a certain soldier whose exemplary cor courage is cast in bronze. A statue of a soldier hunched over another who is wounded and dying. As evening drew near that July, the fighting be began to quiet. Both the Confederate and Union armies had resumed their posts across the battlefield from one another, regaining their strength and planning their strategies for the following day. Cries for help and cries of desolation arose from the wounded left for dead in the middle of the battlefield. No one on either side dared to risk their lives. No one dares to leave the comfort of their safety. And no one dares to enter the thicket of pain and death for fear of losing their own life. No one except one man. Night had fallen, and out from the Union Army, a solitary figure ventured forth into a battlefield that now served as a mass graveyard for the souls of men. The soldier brought water to the dying and aided them, providing comfort and contact, a human presence 
and the hour of death. For no one, no one wants to die alone. And yet the heroic aid of this soldier provided the, the desperate dying much more. You see, the soldier who had the courage to step forward and to serve against the seeming armies of the world was Father Wallet, a chaplain of the Union Army. Father William Corby, a Holy Cross father, the founders of Notre Dame, who also served as a chaplain in the Civil War, recorded this heroic event in his memoirs. Quote, Father Wallet was in the horrible carnage of the seven days on the peninsula. Soldiers who witnessed the scene tell that the bullets came thick and fast as he was there and paid no attention to the danger, announcing that he was not only a soldier of McAllen's army, but that he was a soldier of Christ Jesus. An incident which occurred on, in the Battle of Malvern Hill is related by Major Haverty. The soldiers were in a fierce conflict and they were fighting and firing by the light of the Confederate guns and bursting shells. Father Ouellette, with his stole on and a lantern in his hand, was out at the very front of the line of battle. To the wounded, he would say, are you a Catholic? Do you wish absolution? One man, whom he asked, was badly wounded, but replied, no, but I would like to die in the faith of any man who has the courage to come and see me in such a place as this. On another hill, in the seeming distant past, another battle waged between ancient foes, armies of good and evil, to capture the spoils of victory, our hearts and our souls. It too is, was a hill of suffering, of crushing infirmity, a hill of chastisement, affliction, and stricken, stricken of joy. There, too, in heroic humility, ventured forth under the weight of our sin, carrying the cross of our death, a solitary figure, oppressed and condemned, uttered that collected cry of humanity since our fall from grace. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? On this hill, the ancient battle took its toll on the one who ventured out in pursuit of fallen of humanity, of you and of me. Like water I am poured out, disjointed are all my bones. My heart has become like wax. It is melted within my breast. Parched as burnt clay is my throat. My tongue cleaves to my, to my jaws. They tear holes in my hands and my feet and lay me in the dust of death and I can count every one of my bones. O oh Lord, do not leave me alone. My strength, make haste to help me. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? And still, still he ventured out, pierced and crushed, and yet victorious, looking for the wounded, searching for the lost. Do you wish absolution? Do you want to be set free? For upon that hill, on a Friday, you and I call good. Christ Jesus confronted our fallen world of sin and death and wrestled with evil and the father of lies. He embraced the chastisement that has made us whole. His death transforms. His blood redeems. This Friday is good.
For it is the day that sin lost its power. For God has come to us in such a place as this. For upon that hill called Calvary, in the midst of the mass terrain of humanity's sin and death, of evil and pain, God sent his only son as our redemption to recapture the fallen as a revealing light to the glory of the Father's love for us. Ours were the sufferings he bore, ours the heavy weight of guilt he endured, yet his is the redemption we receive. His is the glory we possess. The tree of death has become the tree of life. His blood has become our sanctuary. His love recaptured and our alienation no more. On a distant hill in Virginia countryside, Father Ouellette became a sign of Christ. His courage, motivated by grace, strengthened by daily faith, imitated the God whom he served. For our God refused, refused to remain aloof and distant to our plight. He did not refuse to pay the price of sacrifice, the show of his love, to rouse our love once more. For the ones whom he loved were in need, in need of glory, in need of freedom, in need of grace, in need of him. From the hill of Calvary to the hill of today, God continues to come to us, to redeem us, to heal us, and through us, to the world. In such a time as this, in such a place as this, Christ is the light, and Christ is the absolution Father Willette offered. Christ is what motivated his life and should motivate yours and mine. In Christ, Father Willette ventured forth to recapture what was lost. In Christ, he offered hope in the midst of madness. In Christ, Father Willette forgot self and loved imitating God who has come to us in such a place as this. May we receive this Good Friday and do the same in such a place as this. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that, leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations. Watch over the works of your mercy, that your church, spread throughout the whole world, may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our most holy father, Pope Francis that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, 
that under him the Christian people, governed by you, their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for our Bishop Bernard, for our Auxiliary Bishop, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the Church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose Spirit the whole body of the Church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace, all may serve you faithfully through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost heart and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of catechumens, that reborn of the, in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Jesus Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, who bestow your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for those who do not believe in Jesus, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love, and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest, grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you, and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of the human race through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those in public office, 
that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, in whose, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and freedom of religion may, through your gift, be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of error, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, grant safety to travelers and return to pilgrims, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength to all in toil. May the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice because in the hour of need, your mercy was at hand through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who suffer the consequences of the current pandemic, that God the Father may grant health to the sick, strength to those who care for them, comfort to their families, and salvation to all of the victims who have died. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, only support of our human weakness, look with compassion upon the sorrowful condition of your children who suffer from this pandemic. Relieve the pain of the sick. Give strength to those who care for them. Welcome into your presence those who have died. And throughout this time of tribulation, grant that we may all find comfort in your merciful love through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Come let us adore, come let us adore. on which hung the salvation of the world. Come let us adore, come let us adore. hung the salvation of the world. Come let us adore, come let us This year there will be only one cross in which to venerate 
you're welcome to come forward under the instruction of the ushers to either touch the cross or to bow before it. If your body is able, genuflect before it in reverence of the cross and the sacrifice offered upon it. We'll start with the beginning of these first, uh, first pews.
At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Please kneel. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Let us pray. Bow your head and pray for God's blessing. May the abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend.